health is a diverse field and it's not just the absence of illness. There are several issues and several aspects that feed into the health sector. It can be finance, it can be legal, social cultural aspects, moral aspects, religious aspects. And today we discuss some of these questions that you may have been asking yourself about ethics, the ethical norms and principles in the health sector. You may have had questions about DNA and forensics in the health sector, about sexual orientation, for example, and such issues that you may have been asking yourself. And we will base our discussion on a book on bioethics of medical advances and genetic manipulation. And it looks at the legal, philosophical, and moral perspectives. And these issues really bring out the intermarriage between the legal profession, the cultural aspects of life and the medical profession. And to discuss this is the two authors of the book, that is Professor Marion Mutugi, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of the University of Kabianga, and the Honorable Justice Isaac Lenaola, who is the Judge of the Supreme Court. Why did you sit down and put all your effort and actually come up with a book like this? I think it, uh, this is an example of serendipity. I kept on asking him questions, and he kept on giving me answers until one day he lost his temper. He says, why are you asking me all these questions? <laughs> no, that's why we wrote it. And, and for me, it was important because at the same time, I was uh, in the high court and doing human rights cases, and I realized that there's a lot of material that needed to be documented around issues like surrogacy, right to life, HIV, AIDS, transgender questions. And so it was a very important partnership to bring our experiences to bear and to produce this book after seven years. We believe that this book is unique because it does not just raise the issues of, uh, of bioethics, but it, uses, it, it shows that technology has overtaken law and law needs to catch up. We have also given pertinent examples within the ethical context of African law and culture and tradition in the different uh, uh, cultural environments in Kenya. To start this discussion, we'll go straight to asking about the ethics. And at page 21 of this book, and um, I'll just quote verbatim what the, what the two authors who are here with us have written about ethics. They've said, finally, and I quote, being ethical is not the same as doing whatever society accepts for most people who make up a society may not accept standards that are, in fact, ethical. And I'd like to ask Professor Mutugi, what is ethical? Who determines what is ethical? Ethical standards are internationally accepted because as human beings, it is now accepted after the Second World War, that human beings have certain in, uh, inalienable rights just by being human. Of course, if a society is ethical, it means that the ethical standards are generally accepted. But there are times that societies and communities have degenerated to a point that things that are right or wrong, acceptable or not acceptable, are a bit vague. And that is when a society is actually in danger of, uh, of actually actual de uh, degeneration. For example, the Nazi Germany, that's where they were when they had all the medical exper uh, experimentations and so forth. But this uh, international accepted standards, the principles are it must benefit a person, beneficence, you must respect a person because a person is a respectable organism and you must be just. There are also several norms that must be maintained both in medical practice and experimentation. One, informed consent. A person must understand what is, needs to be done and give consent. Of course, there is issue of people who have diminished autonomy, people who really do not have the ability to do that and the next of kin do it. Competent personnel, for example, that for a researcher or a medical practitioner, they must be competent. Issues of compensation for research-related injuries or medical procedures that go uh, astray. And there is also a balance between harm and benefit. So these are worldwide accepted as principles and norms of ethics, under which everything that happens to a person in medical practice, in experimentation, 
and indeed in all spheres of a person's life will be judged against. Those actions will be judged against. And it's good you've mentioned informed consent because one of the issues, and you have raised it in the book, is uh, an example of a case of uh, BK versus JD Patel and another, where this was in 1990, where this person was the plaintiff for seeking damages, that the defendant gave a medical report indicating that the plaintiff su suffered from acquired immune deficiency syndrome, that is AIDS, after testing positive for HIV. And I'd just like to throw this to judge here. Why is this case uh, an issue that, well, there was an issue of informed consent or, or there was a problem with consent here? That case is important because it brings out two issues. Uh, one is a general principle that um, a person is entitled to be informed before any medical procedure is conducted on that person. But also it brings out the second issue, which came out in that case, that not every procedure uh, in a hospital, in a clinic, it requires that the doctor must uh, bring out a written document uh, by which the person uh, who's being operated on must give a consent. If you do that, if we were to do that, then we'll tie down doctors uh, and make their work extremely cumbersome. So in that particular case, the court dismissed the case because it said, looking at the circumstances, uh, there was no uh, liability on the part of the doctor uh, in terms of giving that uh, lady a, a, a document to sign as a consent before the uh, medical procedure was conducted. Okay. That one may look like sort of a straightforward case, but there's another one where, this was in South Africa, where uh, the lady demand or had rather said that had she been informed because she was pregnant and the fetus she was carried had, had Down syndrome and she was arguing that had she been informed then she would have gone ahead to do an abortion because then bringing up a child with Down syndrome is a whole other headache. Now in this case had she been inf given all the information then it would have harmed another life, if you look at it like that. Uh, that is an ethical question that uh, confronted the court in that case. Should you um, uh, inform the lady that the child has Down syndrome and then abort? What about the questions about the, the fetus? And is that fetus entitled to a life, including treatment upon birth? So, so that was a question that the court was confronted. And the court again had to strike a balance between the rights of, of, of the lady to informed consent and the rights of the fetus and the rights of anyone else who may have an interest in that case. So again, that is an ethical dilemma that was facing the court, but it applied South African law and made a decision that uh, went whichever way it went. There's always this, uh, I don't know what to call it, misconception or perception that doctors are always negligent, they make a mistake and they get away with it because of one reason or the other. The public seems to to, to see that as what is happening in the medical profession for one reason or the other. And I, I like to give the example of the case of Wahome Mutahi. This was in 2004, where Ricardo and Joki Wahome versus the Attorney General and two others in 2004 claimed that uh, they had entrusted the medical treatment of the late Wahome Mutahi and that the doctors at the time were negligent in attending to him. And the court held that a doctor can be held guilty of negligence only when he falls short of the standard of reasonable medical care and not because in a matter of opinion he made an error of judgment. This may sound harsh to the public, does it? Uh, th that is true, and this case is particularly not notorious uh, uh, in any discussion around medical negligence. The late woman Mutai, popular known as whispers, went for a very simple operation, uh, but at the point of uh, the anesthesia being uh, given to him, he went into a coma and subsequently he died. His wife, Ricarda, then went to court and said that the anesthetist and the doctor, both friends of, of, of the deceased, were negligent in the way they conducted the, the little minor surgery. The court then applied the duty of care test, which is to say, did they go beyond uh, the, did they go beyond the expected duty of care to a home during the operation? And the court then said, sadly, in that case, there was no evidence that the anesthetist or the doctor had done anything wrong outside known medical procedures and processes which would have led to the death of Ome Mutai, and therefore they were guilty of uh, negligence. And so that is the, 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 the test that the courts apply. However, the public 
expect a higher duty of care from doctors. And therefore, the public perception that doctors are, are givers of life, that they are always, uh, they should not be wrong. I think that is, uh, again, the ethical debate and, and dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a patient comes to a doctor from a position of vulnerability. And they come with a, they trust the doctor. That's why they come there. But as the judge has said, many times we expect the doctors to do much more than they are able. Doctors are human, and sometimes they are not able to intervene as expected. So um, it is just the issue of determining whether both by omission or commission, they did or did not do what was within their ability and within their skills in the circumstances that are uh, uh, at, uh, on the table. When it comes to like determining um, whether there's malpractice or negligence, these cases are presented to the medical board mm -hmm. and it's a group of peers and the public uh, usually feels that and probably it's what has informed the amendments to the to the bill and to the composition of the medical board that the person sitting there are doctors and therefore they will be biased and they would defend their own when it comes to you know prosecuting those cases when they have them uh, at the medical board this is a common um, uh, statement made as regards all professions right now there is a big debate whether professionals should be the same ones who discipline themselves it's within the law society it's within the registrars of the engineering board and also with doctors the point is ultimately there is need for credibility of disciplinary processes against professionals that outsiders sit in those processes. So that, for example, the medical board should not always have merely doctors. Let there be a layman, like we have um, juries in, 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 in other states, where a layman can look at the case and say, not as a professional, but as a layman, was there something wrong done to this person? Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's important that uh, we, we take that debate further. And, and, and it happened in the judiciary, uh, in the Judicial Service Commission, we now have members of the public sitting within the JSC, not just lawyers and judges sitting to decide issues around lawyers and judges. So I think there's a, there's a good point made about making it more uh, uh, um, inclusive in that regard. I just want to mention that, uh, like the judge says, for example, in uh, research, when you have ethical review committees, it's not just the, the scientists or the academicians who sit on it, but ethical review commis uh, committees by an act of parliament, the Nakosti Act, states that there ought to be people who represent the community, religious leaders, and so forth, to ensure that uh, justice is done and also is seen to be done. Okay. All right. Now, in the book, you have a chapter on reproduction, and we know I don't know if it's being an African society or just being humans, that issues of fertility and reproduction are really weighty issues to society. And you quoted here the story of Selina, 23 year old at the time, who had undergone a caesarean section after getting preterm labor at Kenyatta National Hospital. And the husband gave consent for her to undergo sterilization of tubal ligation. Then later, this man leaves her because she cannot get any children. And then there had been cases of uh, forced sterilization of women who um, were HIV positive. Why, why is this an important aspect or an important discussion when it comes to issues of ethics and legality and medicine? Reproduction, like you so well put, is an important um, characteristics of all living things. It's about perpetuation of the species. Without reproduction, then uh, that kind, that the species will go extinct. And of course, in human beings, it's even more important because we know what is happening. And sterilization is so important uh, as an ethical concern because it terminates that process of reproduction. And the history of sterilization is uh, plagued with issues of not just informed consent, but issues of um, attempting to do selective breeding. Because if you prevent somebody from reproducing, it means that you are actually influencing their breeding patterns. And uh, therefore, the case of Selena, for example, it raises issues of informed consent because the husband did not have the right to ask that she be sterilized without her knowledge. But also it raises issues of respect for persons. You ought to respect that person to be able to make decisions that are good for her, 
whether she's HIV positive or not, she is an autonomous human being agent who is able to make those decisions. Last but not least, the issue of sterilization has a bitter taste in the mouth because it reminds us of breeding and eugenics, for example, in Nazi Germany, where in an attempt to create a super race, there are those who were considered undesirables and they were sterilized to ensure that they do not reproduce. Even later on, we have uh, cases, and we have quoted it in this book, in Israel, lately, as lately as I just maybe 10 years ago, where some immigrants into Israel were sterilized without informed consent. Again, it brings that issue of racial purity and selective breeding. Okay, and still on uh, matters of reproduction and its cultural practice, and you've quoted here uh, like the Nandi where a lady uh, married another lady, a, a younger lady, because she was postmenopausal to sire or to get children for, for her. But after she died, there was a contention of the estate because, well, these children are ideally not the lady's children. And you've quoted here that um, uh, this was a ruling by Justice Ojuang, and you quoted an authority. You said, uh, Obola, 1980, a female husband is a woman who pays bride well and thus marries, but does not have sexual intercourse with another woman. By so doing, she becomes the social and legal father of her wife's children. And when, when I'm, I'm thinking, when, when this matter comes before court, any court, and we know, according to biology and medicine, uh, a, a father, there's a father who is a male and a mother who is a female, but in this case, it's otherwise. How do you navigate this, um, keeping, uh, being cognizant of the social cultural issues around it? I think in that judgment, uh, my colleague Judge Ojuang, now of the Supreme Court, addressed in the context of one, is not the same as homosexuality or lesbianism. This is a cultural practice that has found meaning in those communities, and it assists women who are, who, who are not able to have children to have children through their so-called wives, and they take care of them as such. Their land is re-inherited by those children, and therefore there is no conflict culturally and traditionally as to whether this woman is married to a woman. But if you look at it in the context of today's world, then you find difficulty. And that is why morality, uh, um, ethics, must have a context. And the context must be the society they're talking about, the cultures you're talking about, and the traditions you're talking about. And that is why the judge had no difficulty quoting from past uh, decisions of, of our courts in finding that that lady was properly married to the other lady, and therefore she was entitled to inherit together with her children. I, I think that's uh, like the judge has said, uh, female to female marriages are what traditional are traditional uh, solutions to infertility and to give um, you know credibility and self esteem to a person who is uh, childless looking at the book clearly uh, Kenya is deficient in guidelines and laws around these issues I think in the book we, we have raised uh, um, a number of issues around surrogacy particularly uh, although there are questions of um, IVF and others in the book, in the surrogacy situations, uh, uh, in the judgments that we've quoted, we address the lacuna which exists in the Kenyan policy, Kenyan laws, as regards this very important issue. Today, a lot of women are turning to surrogacy arrangements to have children. And, and so in that particular case, the difficulty was that this lady is a Kenyan, now moved to the UK, she has these two children through a surrogate mother, and she could not get them to be citizens of the UK because of the arrangements that have been made here. We don't have a law, we don't have policies. And so in that judgment, I, I said that the Attorney General was obligated to now create policies and laws which would assist people who have to go through certain arrangements to have guidelines, doctors to have guidelines to manage this issue. For example, who knows what a surrogacy agreement should contain? It's not just about money, that the surrogate should be paid and then carry the baby. There are other questions which we have raised in the book. For example, the connection between the surrogate mother and the child. And upon birth, the surrogate mother determines, I shall not let the child go. Or the commissioning parents decide the child is born with a medical condition, we shall not take the child, let the child stay with the surrogate mother. So all these questions require a law, they require a policy to manage this very, very important yet useful mechanism for having children. It's a big problem here in Kenya 
because even going one step back and looking at the storage of the gametes, the sperm, the ova, the embryo, there are issues of um, beginning of life, for example, because are uh, those embryos babies? And if it costs to keep them in uh, cryopreservation, so if I don't really want those embryos kept anymore, I don't want to pay for them, can they just be poured down the sink? And is that killing them? Are they real babies? There are issues of beginning of life, for example, because does life start at conception when the sperm and the ova meet? Does it start at implantation? And if it starts at implantation, when you have an intrauterine device which prevents implantation, is that abortion? Does life start, for example, you know, before, without technology, it was easy. Life started when we saw the baby, when the baby was born. But now there's technology that sees the baby even before it is born. And, and, and you see, that debate was, was huge in Bomas 1 in 2002 yes. and I was present. Whether we should have any provision at all regarding abortion in the Constitution. A lot of the evangelicals, a lot of people in churches and, and others were saying, stop at the provision Everyone has the right to life, full stop. Along the way, debate emerged, what do we do if the, 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 there is a condition that requires that the child, the fetus must be aborted? And that is why Article 26.4 of the Constitution was created and enacted and placed there to say there is no abortion allowed in Kenya. However, should a medical practitioner determine that the life of the woman is in danger, then they shall uh, uh, abort. The problem is this, there are no guidelines to guide these medical practitioners. There is no law to guide who can do it, who even is a qualified medical practitioner. So those are the issues that we are, we are facing now. In the book, we have raised the questions that people can debate and determine in today's Kenya, where should we go around the debate on the right to life and the context in which Article 26.4 on abortion can be addressed. There are also issues of euthanasia, assistant dying, because, for example, if a person is in ICU and they have life support, they are on life support, so they are not able to breathe on their own and they have that support. If the doctors or the next of kin says we are tired of paying for this bill and they switch off life support, is that assisted dying? Is that euthanasia? And we've handled that book of active and passive euthanasia. We've handled them uh, and uh, voluntary and involuntary. Suppose uh, I have a patient and I, or I am a patient and I know I'm in the terminal stages of my life and uh, suppose I say, I do not really want to go into life support. I just want you to leave me alone. Is that euthanasia? Because I am actually asking to be denied of interventions that would keep me alive. In the African context, if, for example, if somebody is in, on life support, and uh, 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 who determines who should switch the, the life support off? Are you killing that person by switching off the machine? So this, these are questions that in a traditional African context, you don't want to go near it, because if you want to switch it off, then you've killed the person. How do you carry the, the stigma of having done that? Yet again, Someone has to do it at some point. So these are the questions that we ask in the book. Okay, pertinent questions. So last I want us to look at DNA and forensics. And you know, DNA is such a hot topic, especially now when it's used to determine paternity, it's used to determine cases, especially in the West. And the question uh, that I raise to you after reading the book is, is DNA always a good thing? I, th I think all, all, all indicators now that DNA is 99%, 99.999% foolproof. The only point that we need to be careful about sometimes is what I, we say in the book about handling, storage of, of, of the samples. Because it's very easy to, 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 to tamper. And so, for example, when the, the samples are taken, what comes out of the, of, of the laboratory is not the correct sampling, and therefore courts can very easily use tampered uh, uh, results to make decisions that have life-changing uh, impact. And I know this because in one case I handled, I had to be sure that uh, between here and the UK where the laboratory was, I had, a doctor had to carry the samples, he had to wait for the laboratory to be done, he had to come with the results to send to me again directly. That way now, we didn't afford the opportunity for any party to tamper with the, with the, with the samples. That's only one question, but generally, I think it's important that we realize that DNA, as has been seen in the US, there's a project called the Innocence Project, 
where a lot of people who are on death row have now been exonerated using DNA because the DNA samples were kept for 20, 30 years as technology improved. It's a very important development in the world. In addition, it's a nexus between science and culture. The question that we are trying to answer here is who is a parent? Is it the siring person, the person who actually produces the egg or the sperm? Is it the bearing person, the person who actually carries the baby? Because with surrogacy, you know, you can carry a baby that you have no genetic relatedness with. Or is it the rearing parent, the person who physically, psychologically, and economically brings up the child? But in terms of ethical principles, I think the most important thing there is beneficence. When the DNA uh, analysis on paternity was done, who benefited? Was it the rearing father? Was it the siring father? Was it the woman? Was it the children? And what impact did it have? And in ethics, the, one of the most important things is to recognize that people with diminished autonomy require special care. The children, for example, how did they feel? They have grown up all their lives knowing that X was their father. And out of the blues now, they are told he's not your father. Why is the father? What benefit did they have to get that information? What about the mother, who all through the years had uh, cuckolded the husband that these are your children, and now they wake up and he, he, what effect, what, who benefits? And that is the ethical norm of a balance of harm and benefit. Okay. I know we can discuss this book uh, from cover to cover, but well, we have to end it there. But before we do, who, who are you targeting? to read this book? This book is, we believe, is a good course text in medicine, in law, in biomedical sciences, in religion, in philosophy, but even more important, we have tried as much as possible to put it in a language that is not too technical, so that it is a book that can be read by any person who wants to know the various positions in order to make an informed decision on what will happen to them in either medicine, in research, or in law. Policymakers, legislators. Chapter 21 is a unique chapter because it's recommendations. What we want to see happening around us on this question. So that is our target audience, and our recommendations, I'm sure, will develop into policy, into law. We have been looking at bioethics of medical advances and genetic manipulations, uh, legal, philosophical, and moral perspectives of this, as authored by Professor Marion Mutugi, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor, University of Kabianga, and Honorable Justice Isaac Lenola, Judge of the Supreme Court. This book will be available at bookstores. It has been published by Longhorn Publishers. I've been your host, Dr. Masi Korir.